Hey there! So now that I made that notation video, kind of defined the way that I'm going to notate things when I talk about random physics stuff, uh, I feel a lot comfortable talking about more said physics stuff. Uh, so I guess for my next little set of videos, I'm going to work on talking about momentum, because I feel like momentum is probably one of the most uh, important concepts in physics. It's really probably the most elegant way of talking about Newton's laws. And I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions with momentum, or a lot of confusing areas, maybe not misconceptions. Um, but you know, you run into a lot of confusing ideas, like how exactly do we define an external force? How do we define an internal force? Uh, what does that mean in terms of conservation of momentum? If, con if momentum is conserved in a system, uh, what does that mean? If it's not conserved, what does that mean, right? So I feel like uh, this set of videos uh, will hopefully uh, make all of those types of questions very clear. Uh, so for this first part, I'm going to introduce what momentum is and then talk a little bit about systems. Okay, so let's jump right in. I usually don't just like to leave dangling uh, definitions, but we'll start there. What is momentum? All right, so momentum is vector and it is defined as m times v, where m is an object's mass and v is that object's velocity. Note that momentum is a vector and so is the velocity here. And so essentially we have our velocity vector being scaled up or down depending on what an object's mass is. And so let's go ahead and think about an example here, let's say that we have a ping pong ball moving at five meters per second, and we have a watermelon moving at five meters per second, right? Both the ping pong ball and the watermelon have the same velocity in this situation, and yet the watermelon is going to have a larger momentum than the ping pong ball due to its greater mass. So, right, so momentum is kind of a way to think of a weighted motion. We're taking into account both the raw velocity of that object and also the object's mass. All right, now consider, this is purely a mathematical argument. I have decided to make my mass a function of time and my velocity a function of time. All right. There shouldn't immediately be any reason for me to do this. I mean, of course, we you can imagine that the velocity of an object could change over time, like if it accelerates or something like that. Uh, mass changing over time, eh, maybe not immediately intuitive, but we just decided mathematically to make these functions of time. Because of this, if I take my time derivative of my momentum, we just apply the product rule to, uh, you know, m times v. And so we can see that we have our time derivative of my mass uh, times my velocity plus my mass times my time derivative of my velocity, which of course we know is acceleration. Now, here's the key definition, is that when we take this derivative, let's go ahead and read this out in English, that P dot is the rate of change of my object's momentum with respect to time. This is the definition of a force. All right, the rate of change of an object's momentum with respect to time is a force. Now, the simplest situation for us to make sense of this, right? Because all I've done is I've thrown some functions, some arbitrary functions, and I took their derivative and I said, look, this is a definition. All right, now we got to actually use physics. The easiest way to apply this physics is to think about what is called a point particle. A point particle is an excellent approximation for the actual particles of our universe, right? 
when we talk about a point particle, let's look at this one with a little mass m. This is infinitely small. It takes no or very, 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 very little volume, right? That limit as the volume goes to zero. It's a tiny, tiny particle, infinitely small. But it has a fixed finite mass. This is the simplest particle that we can come up with. It cannot be subdivided. Its mass is fixed. Now, that being said, this particle can move around however it wants. Since it can move around however it wants, it could accelerate, it could speed up, it could slow down, it could do whatever. It has a variable velocity, at least possible. You know, it could be moving with a constant velocity. But we're just talking about uh, this in the context of momentum. So we know that this particle would have a momentum at any given time as its mass, which is just a constant now, not a function of time. And it has some velocity as a function of time. Could be, could not be constant. All right, that's as general as we can go for this situation. Knowing this, when we take the derivative of our momentum with respect to time, now we know that since our mass is a constant, this term goes to zero, leaving us with only one term on the right side of our equation. Remember, we already noted that we could call this time derivative of our momentum the force acting on the particle. And this time derivative of our velocity is simply the acceleration of our particle. And this is where we get F equals MA, which, you know, lots of people commonly associate as like a great way to talk about Newton's second law. All right, let's summarize what we just did. When I'm discussing strictly point particles, that leads to the time derivative of the point particle's mass being zero, and therefore my time derivative of my momentum equals ma, which is also the force on that particle. Now I'm going to talk about systems of particles. I could take multiple of these other particles, and I could just lay them out as such. And these particles are going to interact with each other with these forces that I've labeled here. Uh, we can think of these like gravitational forces pulling the particles together. So let's go over my notation real quick. I've lowered, I've labeled uh, my forces with a lowercase f. The two here indicates that my mass m2 is pulling on my mass m1. So this is the force from two acting on one. Spell that out real quick. Force from two, or from M2, acting on M1, right? And so we can just draw out all of those forces, all of those interactions between our three particles like this. The key here is that as a uh, physicist, I can define my system however I want. So when I go and I define a system, that's really just a way of compartmentalizing my particles. I'm just gonna group these three particles together, and now this is my system. Anything outside of my system, I call my environment. Okay? So the next key point here is that I have internal forces at play here. So first let's define an internal force. Internal forces are generated between the particles of my system only, right? So for example, let's just look at F2, 1. Because F2, 1 is generated by mass 2, that means it is an internal force because M2 is within my system, all right? And because all of my particles are within my system in this picture, all of my forces are internal. 
That means that there's no interaction between my system and the environment. And so we call this an isolated system. I'm going to go ahead and do the exact same thing, but I'm just going to redefine my system a little bit. Now I'm only going to group masses M1 and M3 together. So this is my new system. Again, everything that's not in my system is part of my environment. So with this, let's go ahead and figure out what our internal forces are. Let's go ahead and start by looking at F3 comma 1. Okay, so this force is generated by M3 and acting on uh, M1. Oh, M3 is in our system. Great, this is definitely an internal force, which I noted right here. F13 is also internal. Next, let's address F12 and F32. These forces don't even exist in our system at all. They're not relevant for what we're talking about. They're acting on M2, which is part of our environment. All right, so what about F2, 1, and F2, 3? Right, that's what we have to ask ourselves next. Because what we have going on here is we have a force, F2, 1, that is generated by M2, which is not in our system. It's in our environment, which I summarized here. So. For both F2, 1 and F2, 3, these are forces generated from my particles interacting with M2, which is outside of my defined system. These are called external forces. All right. So the key takeaways from this are how we define a point mass. First off, we recognize that that point mass must have a uh, mass time derivative equal to zero. And then we can build systems of point masses. These systems we can define however we want. Whatever the situation calls for is how we define our systems. Depending on how we define the system, that's going to change what we consider an internal force and what we consider an external force. With these ideas, we'll continue discussing uh, momentum and and what situations does the conservation of momentum arise? All right. Thank you so, so much for watching.